So how much power does your processor draw? Ever wondered if there's a limit? What's your minimum specification? If you want an independent cloud services provider for home servers, VPNs, or clients, consider Linode and sign up today at linode.com slash techtechpotato for a free $100 60-day credit. A recent Gardner performance report shows the Node's topology offers almost double the database performance per dollar than other public cloud services. So throughout the years, there have been many ways to drive up performance. We have better IPC, higher frequency, more cores. We're getting bigger and bigger chips, and we're moving to chiplets. We have eventually reached a fundamental limit in some of those areas where perhaps we can't go anymore. And one of those is perhaps TDP or power consumption. Now, modern desktop processor is what, 95 watts? Perhaps you want something bigger, like an Epic, 280 watts. Where exactly is the fundamental limit here? Well, first I wanna go through exactly what we have in the market. So first up, we have a smartphone around about five watts. Moving to mobile CPUs, run around 15 to 45 watts. Some of them will go a bit higher. Desktop CPUs, usually rated anywhere between 35 to 125 watts, though we have seen them go obviously a lot higher than that. Server CPUs or professional CPUs, we see 65 to 280 watts. And at about 280 watts, you're kind of hitting the limit of what Air can do. Gaming GPUs, 150 to 350 watts, and even go beyond that for some of the pre-overclock models. And you'll see that some of them start to come with liquid cooling. Then we have machine learning GPUs around sort of the 400, 500 watt mark. You can even get 600 watt versions of NVIDIA's AI100. And then we go to dedicated ASICs for machine learning. These are like the AI companies that build extremely specialized silicon just for their workload. I've seen plenty of those go you know, north of 400 watts. And then we have something fun like a full wafer scale ASIC, like either Cerebrus or Dojo, pushing 13,000 watts plus uh, at the high end. So think, what do we use to cool these? At the stupidly low end, we've got something like this, you know, an Intel stock cooler, which is, you know, no good to anyone. Eesh. Then we have something like, I don't know, this crappy liquid cooling that I pulled out of my machine the other week. You know, that would be good for, it's meant to be good for about 120, 150 watts. Then I've got something like this, which is the ice giant. Um, you know, and this is designed to go for on top of your 280 watt thread rippers, and you know, that works well. But beyond air cooling, beyond you know, that sort of liquid cooling that I've got here, there are people who do use more exotic cooling methods. Uh, if you've ever been into the overclocking side of technology, then you'll know that some people use uh, solid dry ice that's about negative 70 degrees or liquid nitrogen. That helps bring the processor down, temperature processor down, so you can ramp up the voltage. Unfortunately, those solutions aren't really good for day-to-day -day use. I mean, there are a few sort of high-frequency trading people who might dabble in that from day-to-day. -day. But realistically, going somewhere between, you know, sort of 280 watts on air to about 350, 400 watts on water seems to be the respectable limit in this industry of how we can cool a chip. Now, in a server environment, shove a few of uh, those 600 watt uh, A100s into a system and as long as you've got you know chilled air intake or if they're directly li liquid cooled then we can start to go a bit higher and this is kind of what I want to go into today. So if we want to go into a modern processor you know this is something like a 3700X we've got the chip inside then we've got some interface material on the inside and then a heat spreader and then we put you know thermal paste on the heat spreader then a big cooler. Now TSMC has been working on doing something to expand what could exactly be done here. So the best representation of this idea is perhaps this. This is from a TSMC. We have our standard uh, silicon at the bottom. Then we've got some liquid metal on top of the chip. And then we've got a copper lid. Now, you know, heat spreaders can be copper as well. Uh, but, you know, this is a fundamental good solution for an air or water-cooled environment. The thing is, what happens if you instead don't want to do, say, you know, a liquid-cooled 
with a pump and a, a water block. How about we go straight to direct liquid cooling, something like this. This is a picture here of uh, somebody who's taken off the heat spreader off their chip. They've put a direct plate and they've kind of sealed the edges and now they're pumping water around the silicon or some sort of non-conductive element at least anyway. Now, in order to do this, what you're doing is you're taking, you know, this sort of closed loop liquid cooler and inside you've got those sort of metallic grooves that help you know, force the water or force the liquid through. Well, what if you directly bond a silicon lid onto your CPU using liquid metal and then shoving water through it? Now, this is stage two of what TSMC has done. Let's go beyond that. Now, we all know that liquid metal is quite good at transferring energy from one medium to another. Ideally, there would be no blockage, but there is something better than liquid metal. Here's a diagram, looks a bit complicated, but the key part here is that you recognize that at the bottom, we've got you know our standard silicon chip. Then on top, we've got the lid that we just saw before with some grooves in, and then the, water, the liquid water comes through from cold to warm. And the interface between them is this silicon oxide thermal interface material, which isn't really a thermal interface material. Now to explain this, Imagine you have two very, very flat pieces of metal and you put them together and you rub them together very slowly. You will get a heat buildup with friction because there are so many interacting surfaces causing that friction. Now, if you do that in a controlled environment under a strong thermal heat, those two metal plates will bond. You can add in a particular gas into the environment to make sure that they bond better and you end up getting these silicon oxide bonds. So you get silicon, oxygen, silicon between both your bottom plate and your silicon lid. And that is a lot more thermally efficient at transferring heat from a chip to you know, a lid or a heat spreader or what have you. How about we go one beyond something like this, direct water cooling. So now you don't have a lid at all and what um, TSLC has done here is etched directly into the top of the chip. Now, modern chips are what we call flip chip designs. You kind of build it up from the transistors all the way to the power, power and data connections, then you flip it over. What most processors will do is then they'll thin the top to get as close to the transistors as possible to make sure that you can get your you know, thermal energy out when you need to. Well, in Instead of doing exactly just thinning, imagine doing some thinning and uh, putting in some grooves or some trenches is the official name for what they call this here. And you end up exactly like this. And you can obviously adjust to how the trenches move down, uh, how many there are, the density of the trenches, and you've got to find out something that works. Now, this is the experimental setup that TSMC had. Uh, the big important thing to note is that the liquid goes from is, is just flowing across the chip from this blue area to the red area, so from cold to hot. The die size of the chip is 780 square millimeters. This isn't a logic chip. This is just um, a chip that they can put heat into. And then the heater area is slightly smaller. And the way it's connected will be under sort of this left-hand image. So you've got your chip that's showing here with the uh, silicon oxide thermal interface material. You've got essentially what is a water block on top. Your fixture is your like your stiffener ring, your shim. And what they're saying here is that an external chiller can be used to create an inlet water temperature at 25 degrees C. Now we've seen water chillers in the past. Intel famously used one with its uh, five gigahertz, 28 all core uh, uh, presentation at Computex. But water chillers are a good way to maintain very low temperatures on your chip. But instead of having you know, a water block in this case, we are actually direct dye cooling the chip. And these are the results that TSMC got. Now, this may look overly complex, but what we have here on the left-hand side is basically showcasing what I've already said. You've got your silicon with your lid, and at the bottom, you've got your direct water cooling. Now, in order to make sense of this graph, what we're plotting here is thermal resistance. So the higher this is, the higher thermal resistance you have, 
and the worse it is for cooling. So low numbers are best. What we've got here is two graphs for saying liquid metal, two for silicon oxide and two for direct water cooling. And these two LPM, 5.8 LPM is your fluid flow, your water flow. So two for two liters per minute and 5.8 for 5.8 liters per minute. So with a faster flow, you expect the thermal uh, abilities of the cooler to be better. And this is essentially what they've found. As you might expect, if you directly water cool the silicon, and as you might expect, the direct water cooling method works best. Here they've said their total thermal resistance is 13. That's your resistance is 11 for the si silicon to water. That's determined by your um, fluid flow. And then your bulk silicon thermal resistance is two, and that's a function of it being directly water cooled. So in the future, the point here is that we may see chips where you have to directly liquid cool them with a fast flow. Well, even though 5.8 liters per minute isn't that fast with pre-chilled water to get the highest power. Now, exactly how much power can we cool? Well, that's what these important numbers up here with direct water cooling on the chip. TSMC is able to cool 2.6 kilowatts on a 780 square millimeter test chip. The whole point about this test is that in the future we'll have stacked chiplets. TSMC has demonstrated 12 stacks. And the point is that they want to be able to find out ways in which they can cool those chips without worrying about um, between chip cooling channels. Now, with the research on this, you either directly cool the whole chip as a whole, you know, like put it in a very cold scenario, or you try and do microfluidic channels to help drive coolant through the chip. And that's one area of research. This one is kind of the easier level of research. Let's just directly put grooves into the chip, chilled water on top of the chip. You're going to end up building chips that can only run in these sorts of environments. Now, the other aspect to this is that these trenches, right? You see this, this is a 2D, you know, um, cross section. And we see, you know, fairly straightforward trenches going down. TSMC tested more than just trenches. They tested pillars. So that means that most of the silicon is cut away. You're just left with a few pillars through which the water can flow through. So we have square pillars as a square, trenches as a triangle, and then just a flat as your, that, as in no, no kind of etched trenches at all as your diamond. And using this uh, sink, simple trench with a two liters per minute flow rate through a square pillar at six liters per minute, you can get about 2.6 kilowatts performance. Actually, is that 2.6, 2.6x? the trench or is that 2.6 kilowatts that that doesn't have a unit on that scale hmm. interesting ultimately however for home use we're still kind of really stuck with solutions that involve air and simple liquid cooling um, if you're really into your water cooling then obviously you can go above and beyond and if you want to run a water chiller you can do that as well just be careful of the noise if you live in places like Finland or above the Arctic Circle, then yeah, you probably get a bit more out of your chip than the rest of us can. But it does mean that in the future, we're gonna see perhaps more specialized data center chips using this sort of advanced trench cooling design in order to get the best out of it. If you remember back at Tesla's dojo day, um, Elon Musk said that if the company was going to continue using GPUs, then they won't have a viable product. That's why Dojo was made. Dojo has its own very custom cooling mechanism and uh, Cerebrus does as well because they're on wafer scale and they're producing more than 10,000 watts in a big chip. But in a standard, you know, standard reticle ASIC, TSMC's managed to do 2.6 kilowatts. So there's still two to three orders of magnitude from the top machine learning GPUs. And we've probably got another 6X on the highest TDP CPUs to go. Now those would be fun to test. So what's my minimum specification here? If CPUs could run at 25 degrees C, that would be great. If you like this content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We also have now a private Discord server. And if you want access to that, become a Patreon member and it'll instantly add you as long as your emails are linked. 
You can join the Patreon for as little as $1.50 a month, and it all goes back into helping the channel. Thank you for your support.